from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello, welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Catherine. She's joining me live from Florida today. And Catherine, she's a speaker, educator, and entrepreneur, and she specializes in a lot of topics that I love to learn about. This is why I invited her to the show today. We'll talk multiple things, but mainly related to HR tech and things, you know, in between. Catherine, first of all, thank you for being on the show today. If you can just, you know, introduce yourself for my audience and what you are up to. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank you so very much for having me. So like you said, I'm Catherine McCord. I'm very excited to be here with you all today. I run a people operations consulting business. So the human side of HR is where I eat, live and breathe. It's kind of my jam. I also speak internationally on the topics of innovating hiring and innovating neurodiversity inclusion, as well as disability inclusion. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's the short version. Oh, I also, I always forget to say this. I, I also invented the first ever anti-bias applicant tracking system that fires the resume. So that's another one. There you go. Oh, and wow. I'm the COO of the Octopus Movement, a global neurodiversity movement. There you go. That's all of it. Now I'm done. It, that's, that's amazing. That's great. Let's start from you, because you mentioned in your introduction, mm -hmm. um, I read about it before, but I would love you because, you know, you are an advocate of it. Uh, neurodiversity. So if, if you can a little bit elaborate about what is neurodiversity and how, you know, it can help us uh, succeed in our careers. Oh, I got you. Yeah. No, neurodiversity is awesome. So I, and, and it's so cool because this is something I've known for a long time and now like the rest of the world is catching up and science is catching up. And so I'm super excited about this. So uh, the, the term neurodiversity was coined by an Australian sociologist named Judy Singer. And it's to bring the idea that difference is not a deficit to it when it comes to how the mind works. And that has since turned into a whole movement. And now the term is used to define a medically visible and or diagnosable difference in how a person processes information and stimuli. So think everything from cerebral palsy and traumatic brain injury, all the way over to obsessive compulsive disorder, autism, dyslexia, and even uh, bipolar and other uh, mental health diagnoses as well. So anything that affects how you process uh, the world around you, that's a neurodiversity. It's a, the diagnosed population is about 15, uh, maybe 20% of the population at this point, but the suspected actual neurodiverse population is closer to about a third of the world's population. So this is a big, big population. And part of the reason that we're finding for that is that there is now scientific evidence, and this study can be found in the National Library of Medicine, is uh, that there are links between certain neurodiversities, uh, in particular autism as, and possibly a couple of others as well, uh, with the genes that cause humans to evolve. So kind of the, it, the, one of the theories is that this is the direction that we're going as a human race, is that pretty soon everybody will kind of fit into this category, you know, several generations from now, which is fascinating. Um, but the other thing that's really come to light is that there used to be idea, this idea that all of these things were deficits, right? They were something wrong. And what we've come to realize is that doesn't even make sense, right? So we've known for, for you know, a very long time in the medical community that when the body has something, it has an area in which it struggles over here, it has a weakness, if you will, then on the other side, it compensates. So you, you may have heard that somebody who loses their sight, their hearing will increase. Yeah. Uh, somebody who loses their taste, right, their smell will come. So it's a similar type concept. And so while your mind may have a difficulty over here, like let's use, uh, let's use dyslexia as an, as an example. So it, while you may struggle 
uh, when it comes to reading and writing. Then over here, you have your know, super creative thinking and 3D modeling mm-hmm. and going on in the brain. And so there's this kind of balance, right? And we have found that that's what breeds innovation. Uh, and you can look at any invention that you want to, and you're going to find neurodiversity, even going back um, in, before this was really a concept. Uh, individuals have had their profiles examined by scientists and doctors and it's been like, oh, well, yeah, clearly this was going on, right? Even back to Albert Einstein, uh, Hedy Lamarr, who was not just a Hollywood bombshell, but also the inventor of the technology that led to Bluetooth and and so on and so forth. Really cool lady. Um, and it and, and even further back, not even some of the great musicians uh, like Mozart, you know, were very clearly mm-hmm. neurodi- yeah. <laughs> neurodiverse, right? So so when you get that innovation, you get that creativity, a lot of times that's from neurodiversity. And uh, even Hewlett Packard was founded by neurodiverse individuals. They did something amazing a few years ago, which was that they created a neurodiverse hiring and cultivation program in which everyone was supported and working in a way that was natural to them. So that meant if they wanted to get up and pace while they worked, great. If they wanted to sit on a yoga ball instead of a chair, great. Noise canceling headphones. And, you know, what work buddies, whatever it was that they needed or wanted, that's what they did. And what they found is that that team became 33% more productive than the rest of the the, the counterpart teams, which is extraordinary. So we've, we've kind of come to realize that it's not just about neurodiversity and superpowers, but also this idea that when you let people work in a way that's natural to them, the productivity increases, the innovation increases, creativity, uh, and even all the way over to your profits. So Boston Consulting Group did a study and showed that when you're fully um, inclusive in terms of how you let people work, including with the neurodiverse community, you will see an an average of 19% higher profit. So there you go. (laughs) That's the short Uh, version. (laughs) Yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, I have interviewed a couple of, I think one month back, uh, Jason Detrich, who he has like a dyslexia, I think, mm-hmm. and and he's working in NASA today. So you know, and he, and you know, I, I was curious, you know, to to understand. And he's we were discussing about STEM education, but you know, I can see, you know, the, the you know, the, whatever whatever you just described now. So you see this aspect of creativity, and you know, like uh, I've seen a lot. I was lucky, I would say, to to meet a lot of people also. Um, with, with similar, um, the nice thing is that we call it ability, not disability, right? So, so we should call yes, it ability. Yeah. Uh, and, and I do want to be clear, though, I'm real quick, because you said that disability does come with neurodiversity too, and disability from the medical standpoint um, or the psychiatric standpoint. But that's not the whole story, right? That's just that's just a piece of the whole situation. Yes. Yes. And actually, there is one thing here, at least I can talk about the place where I live. So here, they removed the word disabilities, you know, people with disability, and they replaced it with something called people of determination. So because, you know, these people usually really, they are, they are more, you know, keen to show the world that, like, okay, regardless what we have, you know, whether it's a physical or um, mental, let's call, issue, they can still right. add to the society, which is, I like it also as well. Now, 100%, yeah. Can, can you just like tell me a little bit about, you know, regarding the neurodiversity, how you have, you know, embedded it in, because I know that you have something called the Titan management. Yeah. And you did the design of the, what you just mentioned about the mm-hmm. anti-bias applicant tracking system. So how mm-hmm. you embedded all these together um, when, when you designed the system? Well, I, so just, just for full disclosure. So I am neurodiverse multiple times over. So I have uh, actually, uh, I have uh, four different neurodiversities. Um, the two that I talk about the most are my OCD and my bipolar. And I like to be very clear because a lot of people say things like, well, we all have OCD. No, <laughs> no, you don't. Um, I literally count everything that I do. I'm obsessed with even numbers. Uh, It also Mm -hmm. makes me very highly organized, which is great for work, by the way. Super awesome for work. Um, I malfunction if I get something wrong or I don't hit, you know, or if I miss an appointment or if I'm one minute late to an appointment or something like that, because I'm so obsessed with having everything exactly a certain way. Um, Oddly flexible on my teams, I've been told though. So that that made me happy because I'm afraid that that would carry over right to that work. So 
um, a while back, I realized how broken hiring tech was. Um, and it, it basically, so it, it, they, the ATS, the applicant tracking system came to be as an answer to the mass job boards that were created, right? It's like monster.com, career builder, indeed, et cetera. And so they needed a way to track all these applicants that were coming in now, right? These companies needed this. They built that, the first applicant tracking systems. Mm-hmm. And while they've developed some cool new features like automated email and uh, scorecards and stuff like that, the basic layout has not changed since the 90s, which is absurd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's completely absurd. So, and they also um, have, they're also inherently biased creating and they're inherently not designed for people in the disability community and people with neurodiversities. Um, they're just, they're not structured that way. And so I gathered together a, an amazing group of humans for some focus groups, people from all over the world with every diversity that I could possibly find, right? Um, and brought and brought people and some different people with this, you know, the same diagnosis, things like that. And we, I had all the, their feedback and every single bit of it was implemented into the system. Um, with the idea of creating a fully inclusive application experience that also is a lot more helpful than a resume because resumes, you know, you can read articles about this and, you know, uh, Harvard's published a great one. Um, there's been, there have been others as well, like on LinkedIn, uh, there have been several articles published about this. Resumes are not an effective way for candidates to communicate about themselves, mostly because there's not really a right or wrong way to do it, right? It's just kind of whatever people feel like doing. <laughs> At least here in the state, that's that's very much the case. Um, and and then they're also very bias generating because you know you see names, you see maybe location, you know things like that. And this this type of information is very much bias creating. And so we wanted to get people through that first push, right? When when the unconscious bias can can really come into play, because a lot of times what I found is once people get past the application process, if the company likes you that's kind of just it right so um so the idea was to get people past that initial hump give them a more pleasant experience help them align better to the job so the the profile that we designed is anonymous um, at first until you decide to move forward and then it um at which point the candidate unlocks it for you once you've said hey i'm interested in you the candidate unlocks their profile and then you can see their name and phone number and all of that and then it helps them to completely align themselves to the job. And when I started showing it to hiring managers, they would they looked at me and go, oh my gosh, this is great. This is exactly what I need. This is actually the information that I need from people. And I said, yeah, it's almost like I've submitted candidates to a bunch of hiring managers over the years or something, you know? <laughs> almost, almost like I knew what I was doing with that, isn't it? Um, but I, that's basically what it, the, the structure was modeled after was my submittal emails that I would send to my clients when I was in recruiting. Um, so that's so we just kind of completely reframed it, and we changed how questions were, were asked so that they were better for people with neurodiverse um, brains, and we just kind of re- redid everything so that everybody felt included and everybody felt that it was a productive way to present themselves. Wow, that's that's really great. Now, the, you know, I I want to add you know a couple of things about uh, what you mentioned. Uh, you know, it caught my 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 ears when you said you cannot judge someone by just a resume. It's yeah, and you know, like there are a lot of other things. So, for example, like you cannot judge a student by just an exam, which is like a one hour and set of twenty questions. Yes, right, <laughs> same thing. And yeah, you cannot judge. You cannot judge also like same thing a candidate and. You know, like how we can do it, and this is you know would lead me to because you you talk about um, that HR tech is 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 wrong, and you know it needs yeah. it needs a major correction. So what what are the things you 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 would add to that? I would say. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, so there's so much with with HR tech because it's not just the applicant tracking system, right? There's HRS. There's there's all these different systems. Um, some of the, some of the main things that that I would love to see changed is um, how information is is processed into them. So, meaning um, the way that questions are asked, the way that we gather information, down to that gathering of what we call here in the state the EEOC data. Uh, so, like you know, gender, uh, 
your uh, veteran status, you know, that type of dis- mm. disability, this type of thing, right? So these things should be collected anonymously. They should not be associated with the candidate's profile in any way, shape, or form. Now, there's good reasons to have that data, right? It makes sense to have that data, uh, but you don't need it associated with a candidate's profile. There's no need to. That If that's not part of your hiring process, if that's not why you're hiring them, then you don't need to know it. Another big thing is to take away the superfluous information. If you don't need to know it, then why have it, right? It's even the same thing when you right. interview people, right? Like, why are you asking questions that have nothing to do with why you're, you know, why you're hiring them? That makes no sense. Um, and then also with HR tech, how questions are and in, in how fields are filled out. So for instance, even on, um, on uh, like the HRIS systems, you know, which kind of stores the employees once they've been onboarded, the way that things are asked sometimes just make no sense. And so you see a lot of times HR people having to go through and like clarify what things mean and help people with things, just word it better, you know, and take out, and there again, take out fields. I have spent, I mean, because I'll go through and I'll fill out these things periodically to, you know, just see how they work. And there was one where I was looking at it thinking, I should have been done with this in five, maybe seven minutes. And it took me almost an hour because it kept repeating the same questions. It kept, you know, it was just, it was just asinine. And there was a bunch of stuff in there that just really didn't, you know, or if I had, if I had uploaded a document, it could have just parsed it out, you know, for me. And I should yeah. have had to sit there and manually fill it out. So being a lot more aware of the human experience, um, making things a lot more streamlined because they're way too complicated they are so efficiency and then um also like i said just do it better you know and and take a take away the silliness that's in there. oh and the discrimination aspect take that right on it yeah 100 percent. and you know like again um from technology perspective i mean technology hiring in tech i think there is uh, a lot of repetitive things that comes and, you know, the formats that they do even like forget only about the tracking of the application, like, you know, the, the, the way they, they do it in a robotic way, I would say. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's you know, terrible. It's, um, it makes no sense. Um, it's unbelievable. Like, because someone used to do it, and you mentioned something like a couple of minutes ago, like, uh, you know, when we used to see, do something in, in the 90s and used to work, that doesn't mean you know, necessarily that it's still applicable. Right. Like, <laughs> right. yeah, like, like, okay. now, can you imagine in the IT world, if you looked at somebody and said, well, we did it this way in the 90s. Why do you want to change it? They fire you. <laughs> no, tech has evolved since the 90s. Goodbye. And yet HR tech is just still sitting there. Just- yeah. And this is why I keep bringing the HR tech and hiring couple of times and I'm repeating because I know maybe someone would, didn't catch the previous episode. So maybe hopefully they will be listening or watching this this time, um, especially startups. Like what we can tell oh, startups, yeah. new, new companies about how they can streamline, you know, their hiring process and, you know, take into consideration. So also, you know, the, the, the topics that we just discussed, like neurodiversity and inclusion and all right. these uh, topics, right? So it's simple. Right. It's so easy to to hire effectively. And yet so many companies just don't do it. So so here's here's my rundown of how you hire effectively. First of all, get all the details together before you start looking. That means your budget. So the salary, um, any bonus, uh, you know, what the, you know, the the basic outline of what they're going to do, so on and so forth. Then do not create an ideal candidate profile. I see so many companies do that. And it's actually counterproductive because what happens is your mind then sees that that is the correct answer and anything outside of that isn't going to work for you. Well, that's not how humans work. Humans don't fit into a little box. So you just X out a whole bunch of candidates that would have been terrific for you. So instead of that, focus on the problem that you need solved and find someone who can do it. Don't focus on years of experience because who cares? I mean, I've seen IT people who've been doing it for 15 years and they're still stuck on the oldest technologies out there. They don't know anything past C++, right? And then I know, uh, and then I've seen people that are, you know, only a couple of years past their degree and they're brilliant, you know, and they're out there just just innovating the space. So years of experience is not what matters. What matters is expertise level. That matters. Yeah. And ability and talent. That's what matters. So focus on those things. Um, and then make sure that you don't accidentally put discriminatory 
uh, uh, qualifications in your job description. So for instance, uh, and people, how could you accidentally do that? Well, it happens all the time. So for instance, I had a client recently, I was helping them you know, get some, get some things together. And they said, okay, we need people who can stand for a long period of time. I said, why? And they said, well, you know, the height of this work area, it's this, this and this. I said, couldn't they use a standing stool? They go, mm-hmm. oh yeah, yeah, I guess they could. Right. And they didn't mean it as anything, right? It just, it just didn't occur to them <laughs> that that was highly discriminatory. So it doesn't be that mean that the person needs to stand. They just need to be able to be at this height, <laughs> you know, for whatever. And I told them, they said, well, maybe, you know, we couldn't hire a person with a wheelchair. I said, yes, you could, because there are wheelchairs now that can be raised up. Like they just push a button and up they go, you know? Yeah. So I said, be real careful. I said, don't assume. So that's kind of the message. Don't assume what people can and cannot do. And that's the biggest thing. We place all these assumptions, right? So like, you know, you see, so my mom, for instance, she, she loves that I use her as an example for this. So she has debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, has a little walker, right? She looks so pitiful when she's going along and then she opens her mouth. <laughs> This all other world of of experience from her, right? And so she yeah. would she would go into meetings and people would be like, "Oh, look at the poor or, little lady," you know. And then she'd open her mouth and she rocked the whole meeting, right? And so if you had just seen her walk into a room, you might think, "Oh, you know, she's disabled. She can't do this. She can't do that." Mm-hmm. And then you hear her and you see how she functions. And that woman worked over eighty hours a week until she she very recently retired. Um, and she was uh, she was an executive at a major hospital system in the HR realm. And so she was walking all over the hospital, doing different things, rocking you know rocking life. So you can't just assume. I have a friend in um, in Belgium, and he is uh, he has cerebral palsy. He is he uh, is in a wheelchair, but he is also, or I should say, and he is also a jujitsu champion and a model. Wow! So. <laughs> so you just never know, right? You know, so don't assume. That's another big one for startups. Don't assume. You know, it's so easy to get stuck. Um, in terms of your interview process, keep it keep it simple. Not everybody needs to interview everybody. And if you're at the top of the company or at the top of the department, you don't need to be interviewing the entry level or staff level people. So in other words, if you're a director, you do not interview staff level people. Managers do that. And that's where it stops. It does not need to go past that. And if you don't trust your managers to hire your people, you need new managers. That's or or you need to work on yourself. <laughs> Maybe the problem is you, right? <laughs> Maybe you need to let go of some stuff. But that's kind of it. So you know, trust your people. Don't and don't over interview. None of these long, stupid processes. I've never understood that. Um, keep it simple, um, and and don't assume. That's the biggest thing that kills people in their hiring process is assuming. And I know that you talk about something else, which is like not years of experience, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hate that. That makes me nuts. <laughs> uh, just like before, you, you know, I, you put like your, 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 you know, opinion on that. Yeah. It irritates me, you know, when I see I'm not applying for jobs. Now I, I left the corporate. <laughs> so, much. but. Still, I see this post, and you we, we see a lot of meme about that, where they put, "We need ten plus years experience in blah 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 blah," right? And yeah. funny enough, sometimes the technology just started to exist five years back, and you see still yeah. they write, "We need we need yeah. fifteen years," you know. Like the other day, I've seen like I think it was related to to something which is like just recently, you know, like generative AI, right? So generative AI, yeah. of course, it was there. But obviously, they need someone who understands chat GPT. And what yeah. they wrote then, we need someone with 10 years plus experience in... Nobody's going to have that. <laughs> but, but I someone, someone is lazy and copy-paste. But <laughs> that. Yeah, no copy-paste. Let's add that to the list. No copy. Yeah, so you can tell us about that. Uh, sure, sure. Um, so... So first of all, I see this a lot. In fact, one thing kind of to your point that's been really cracking me up lately is you see a lot of job descriptions because I'm always looking through this stuff, right? This Because I like to stay really in touch with what's going on. And I see a lot of job descriptions that say like, you know, 10 plus years in DE&I. And I'm like, you do know that was not a job title until like three years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, they may have been doing that type of work, but they're not going to have that title. And you know what they're looking for? Titles. That's what it is. 
So that's another one, by the way, ignore titles. They don't even... So how many times have you seen somebody that it says like VP, right? And really all they were was, was like a developer, right? Uh, which is not, not... I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a developer. My point is they were not a VP, right? They were not doing executive type work. Um, mm-hmm. this, and that, used to, that happens a lot in the financials too. So be very careful with titles. But that years of experience thing, Always cracks me up because number one, a lot of times it's it's not a thing, especially in tech. I, I'm with you. I, so I recruited in IT for many, many years and still do sometimes from time to time. And I see a lot of that. I'm going, you do know that technology is not that old, right? But also the problem with it is, is just because somebody's been doing something a long time does not mean that they're good at it. Yeah. I see that all the time. Here's an example. So... Uh, because ADAR is, you know, kind of my jam. So I I once had a situation in which a person who had been an HR manager for t- for over 10 years, just a little over 10 years, in one fell swoop, <laughs> completely discriminated and broke federal law. I think participated in the process that broke federal law and dang near cost her, her company a huge multi-million dollar lawsuit. Um, and it was it was obvious it was it was a thing that nobody would have ever so what it was was somebody requested an accommodation, and she immediately wrote them up for ha- based for the exact thing for which they requested mm-hmm. an accommodation, and they'd requested it for a while, and they'd just gotten a response and all this. This was an ongoing. They knew about this, and so it was like, what in the world? And then she defended it. By the way, that was the funny part. It wasn't like, oh my god, I'm such a bonehead, right? Nope, defended it. <laughs> That's so. There, that's that's a thing. That's a situation in which somebody has all these years of experience, but never actually bothered to hone their craft. So when you're interviewing people, look at what they actually know. And I think you know a, a big problem too with hiring is not a lot of people are taught how to interview properly, right? And it's not the candidate's job to be good at interviewing; it's ours. You know, we got to move past that. Well, they weren't a good interview. Are you hiring them to be a recruiter? No, then who cares? <laughs> like, unless they're going to be, you know, interviewing people, who cares how they interview? It's, do you think they can do the job? And your job as a leader is to bring out of them their talent and to help them showcase themselves in the interview. So when mm-hmm. you're interviewing people, you know, it's on, on us as the hiring team humans, especially on the recruiting side. I want to say that. A lot of this should should start happening on the recruiting side, right? Um, to support the hiring managers, um, but bringing out this person's talent—that's your job, not theirs. They're not professional interviewers, and and some people are, re- especially in the neurodiverse community, right, are really good at their jobs. But interviewing is just not going to happen, right? I had a I had a candidate years ago. He was one of my favorite candidates of all time. And I was recruiting him from one high-level financial institution into another. And he was a cybersecurity professional. And he emailed me uh, right, right off the bat and said, I do not do phone interviews. Mm-hmm. Not going to happen. He said, this is how I interview. He laid it out, provided the exact structure. We did the whole thing. Uh, we had to kind of coax him a few times to get exactly what we needed out of him. They hired him for an astronomical sum. Because this was, let's see, this was about 10 years ago and he was hired for over 300000 a year. <clears throat> so a huge, huge salary for somebody in that, you know, in that world. Um, and he rocked his role. <laughs> and he worked in his own way and he did his own thing. And he just, you know, interviewed the way that he needed to. So we need to be flexible with our interview style and we need to be ready to bring out the answers that we need regardless of how the person presents. So, and I, so I've told people that I've had people go, well, they didn't interview well. I said, that's your fault. Yeah. And they kind of pause and they're like, what? I go, that's, that's your fault. You're the recruiter. Why didn't you make the interview better? You know, it's like, now if you're saying that they weren't qualified, right, that's different. That's, that's fine. Or if they said something off putting, okay, that's fine. But if, if the flow wasn't good, if the conversation wasn't good, that's, that's on you. You've got to stop and make people feel more comfortable. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, I, and it, it reason many points you mentioned resonate because you know I have these things also myself personally. Um, so, with with your experience, uh, Catherine, like in people operations and HR tech, what are some of the major trends you foresee in these areas for the next few years? 
Oh, that's a good question. So I think for trends that we're going to see, well, I'm going to start with what I don't like. Um, a lot more AI. And here's where I don't like it and where I do. So I love AI as an assistant kind of capacity. So mm. for instance, and I did kind of, oh, the company name is eluding me right now and I really wish it wasn't, but there is a company out there that created basically a an AI assistant for recruiters. And so candidates can go in there and get basic information on the company, the role, all of this uh, from this virtual assistant. And that is awesome. I am mm. all for that. And they did it beautifully inclusive uh, they really knocked it out of the park. Huge fan of that. Where I don't like that I'm seeing AI is that there's this this idea that AI can kind of replace recruiter or replace the sourcing part of recruiting, and you know tell you which candidates properly align and all of this. Not mm. one. I, I've gone into HR tech conventions, played with every single one of these things, and within three to four minutes, I've just these poor developers just look sunk down and I feel bad, but I'm like, look, your technology is cool, but it doesn't replace what a human being can do. And here's why. Right. And, and so we need to get past this idea that AI, AI is nowhere near replacing a human mm. being at this point. It's just not a thing. We got to get away from that <laughs> and, and use it for what it can be useful for at this point, right? Like there are things for which it's wonderful. I think it'd be great for onboarding and education. Big fan of that, right? So AI is going to be a huge trend in, in this space. You're going to see a lot more work in the inclusion space and making tech more inclusive, uh, which is very interesting. And there are some companies out there doing it really well. There are some that have just completely missed the mark. And it's really funny. The difference between the two, the ones that are doing it well, are the ones who are asking people and not just assuming what people need. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are out there actually talking to the humans and having people from different diversities and all play with it, those are the ones being successful. The other ones are flopping horribly. So I think that's, that's going to be a big, a big trend. Um, and then another one that I'm very excited about is that uh, there are starting to be more and more tools built around supporting people once they're in an organization and making sure that they have the growth that they want, the opportunities that they want, that they're having the right kind of experience, matching them with mentors, you know, these types of things. And I'm really excited to see that building and to see, you know, continued education, skill building, certificate earning, uh, and again, just even the soft skills and things like that connect you to other people within your company that could you know, be good resources. So for instance, I saw one that if the um, if somebody over like, let's say customer success is interested in design, then they'll find them somebody who is interested in being a mentor over at product design and they'll kind of pair them together, which I think is super freaking cool. Um, so I think things like that are going to continue to grow. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, you know, I like, you know, what you mentioned about, you know, inclusion and how some companies are doing it well, while others, they assume. And the best way we, we, we said this multiple times uh, on the show, you know, because we cover startups, you need to go talk to your customers or potential. Oh, yes, yes and, 100%. <laughs> and the other thing about use of AI, and again, we, we, we discuss it a lot of time. So, the way personally I see it, is, as you mentioned, is like a augmentation. People start to use this word nowadays, um, augmentation. So it, it's something that will help me to do other yes. things, you know, in, yes. in faster, maybe more efficient way. But of course, there will be always the reliance on us humans. And I repeat, guys, don't be afraid of AI. AI doesn't work. No, itself. no, uh, it's, it's not Skynet. Okay. It's so sh <laughs> <laughs> she said, it's not going to be the Terminator. It, it's okay, you know. Um, and, and I do want to say, so chat, like, you know, chat GPT is is cool. You know, it has its 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 purposes. But I see this weird movement on LinkedIn, like where, where, where people are telling, and not recruiters, just random people are telling people to use, or telling job seekers to use chat GPT to like reach out to recruiters and stuff. Please don't do that because you can immediately tell that a robot typed that up. <laughs> that, that, that is going to be weird and it's going to be awkward. Please don't do that. 
Um, now, if you let somebody know up front that your written communication is not really your thing, that so this is something that you're doing as a reach out, that's different. That's part of inclusion. Um, so just just if that is something that you need to do because that's you know part of your diversity, that's cool. But let people know up front, you know, that this is what you're doing because it helps you to communicate a little bit better. Acknowledge it because if you don't, it just comes across odd. If you acknowledge it, it's fine. If you don't, it comes across super weird. Yeah. Um, now, one point I don't want to leave without asking your opinion about it. And again, I repeat these topics because they are important, I believe. And the main thing we see usually in startups and we see it in actually everywhere. It's not like only in startups, but because, you know, in startups, it's like more, I would say, challenging uh, workplace. Mm -hmm. Mental health. So... Um how 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 this fit into the workplace? That is a good question. And it's one, and sometimes my answer surprises people on this one. So number one is the employer's responsibility is obviously good benefits, right? Um, I even encourage a lot of companies if they have the bandwidth and the budget to have you know telehealth and things like that available so that people can you know, have little touch points as they go, um, have mental health break, you know, rooms, things like that. Um, if you can, if you're that size organization. But outside of that, the only obligation that the company has is to create psychological safety and a mentally safe environment. So no abuse, no, uh, you know, no discrimination, uh, psychological safety also, it, it primarily involves being able to speak up, ask questions, and dissent without fear of reprisal. That's your job as the employer, those things. Past that, um, I want to give grace to people who are going through personal uh, issues. You know, it's, you know, it's called reasonable accommodation for, but past that, I'm seeing an odd trend where it almost seems like people feel that others, other humans, uh, you know, entities, whether it's a job or otherwise, are responsible for their mental health. Nope. I've even seen posts where people say, managers should be trained to diagnose. No, that is a doctor. <laughs> no, 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 no. These are not mental health professionals. You do not want that. That's going to go weird directions. I promise you. No. None of that. We need to be, we do need to be training managers and leaders on an HR how to better support people going through this. Uh, that's important. You know, what are the things you do and do not say to your team members when they come to you with, with, a, with an issue, a personal problem? Um, you know, how do you accommodate them? That kind of thing. That we do need to be training them on. That we need to provide wisdom. But it is, it's not the employer's job to make you mentally healthy. That's it. That's it. That's your job. That's your responsibility. So the employer's job is to support you and to make sure you have the right benefits and to make sure that you have the right support at work. And then past that, it's their responsibility to accommodate you as you need it uh, and as far as it can possibly be reasonably done. So that's, that's kind of... A, so there is a responsibility with the employer. It's an important responsibility. It's part of integrity. It's part of being a good employer. But past that, I think that we need to also remember that that's our job. It's not our medical <laughs> access. Yeah. It's not our, you know, it's not our family. So we need to also keep that line very clear because right now it's starting to get blurred and that's not really right. You know, your manager is not your counselor. That's not a thing. No, no, no. And please don't expect that. <laughs> That's very, very true. Yeah, because you know, yeah. you're not a, you are not a doctor to to diagnose your uh, your employees. I've seen yeah. multiple posts about that. I'm like, what? No, no, that's that's weird. Because you know, like, actually, sometimes the mental health issue comes from, I would not say bad relation, but because some disagreement, let's call it, between a manager and the people who yes. report to, to him or her. And then you cannot like give the same guy or, you know, the same, yeah. you know, yeah, like, oh, you, yeah, yeah, you, you cannot do this. I mean, you, you give him the, the uh, you know, the uh, authority to, to do such 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so it's, 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 so it's like and, someone beat me and they ask him, he, he would be the judge at the same time. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, that makes no sense. That's completely illogical. At, like it makes, it's completely yeah. utterly ridiculous. I don't understand. So the other side to this too is, you know, so you did hit on you know, the, the abusive boss, right? So that again goes back into what I was talking about, the training of your leadership, of your HR and all this, how to actually handle this. One of my pet peeves is when I see HR people say, Oh, well, he didn't mean that. Or I know him, he or she or whomever, you know, um, I know them. They didn't X, Y, Z. What? You're, literally your whole job is impartiality and, and being the, the middle person if you're in HR. Uh-uh, no. And so that's part of creating the, the right environment, right? So when you're hiring your HR person, one of the number one things that you should be looking for is impartiality and the, the ability to rise up above even issues that hit them very personally and to look at it fully objectively. When you're hiring an, an DE&I expert, make sure that they understand that inclusion cannot be exclusive. In other words, they should not be focused on one or more, dis- on one or more diversity. It should be everybody and everybody's experience. And it should be a global concept. If you bring somebody in who's a specialist, that's great. But they're not your D, they should not be running your DEI program. That's not mm-hmm. how that works. Also, DEI people should be working themselves out of a job. It should happen. If once you, if you've done your job, it's so ingrained in the culture that then you're no longer needed. And you should have KPIs for your DEI people, by the way. Um, and then this goes into other things about, so you shouldn't put somebody in a leadership position who has an ego the size of Texas, you know, <laughs> if you shouldn't do that, you know. Work with them first. And, and just because somebody was a great performer in their current job does not mean that they are a manager. That's not a thing. And there are some people who are not great managers, but they're excellent executives. You know, so kind of, you know, know people's strength when you're, when you're hiring and all that, because that's going to make a difference. Oh, wow. I wish every single CEO in startups <laughs> listen to this. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's seriously. Good, right? Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's we're going to do another, another one just on that yeah, let, let's, let's keep it let's keep it here <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep it here no I, I share I share my opinion very openly on, on LinkedIn mainly and other places about you know what I'm seeing happening especially in the tech um, yeah. companies and startups and the way you know they put things all together it's nonsense for me. And you mentioned something yeah. which I have to, to com- put this comment, but in another way. If someone did very well in company A, doesn't necessarily mean he will do well in your company. That's... And vice versa. Yes. Vice versa. And if you assume yeah. that this guy, you will bring him here and he would be plug and play from day one because he was successful in a company that used to do the same thing as you are doing. Yep. No, no. no. <laughs> and it, it can be the other way around. Yes. Where someone who doesn't perform well here, maybe you bring him and he would be 100% crashing it. Let's, let's say this. 100%. 100%. Right. And even under different leadership, that can make a difference. Within the same company, somebody maybe struggle in this department, you put them with a different manager that just, you know, with whom they just jive better and he's a little bit stronger leader for them. And all of a sudden, they're they're selling. Yeah, hundred percent. I've seen yeah. this. I've seen this. Yes. I, 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 no, no over, one yeah, over again. Yeah, not I once or twice. Like, all the time. <laughs> all the, all time. the time. All the time. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Catherine, as we are coming to the end, um, I have a question, which sure. is a weird question. Oh, is there is there an <laughs> is there any any question you wish I asked you? And please feel free to ask. Oh. You know what? I, you, you kind of covered a very broad, a very broad scope and I kind of went off on some tangents. So I think we kind of got it all covered. I, I will say, I guess maybe the one, the one thing is, you know, as you're, as a startup, especially because that's my, that's my jam. I love my startups. I, I loved, I've taken on bigger clients too, and they're all well and good, but I love my little, my little baby startups. Right. So to hit really hard on kind of a point that you just made. When you're a startup, remember 
that this is a completely new adventure. This is about, and you need to have a strong mission and a strong vision. And that's how you hire your people. The people that align with your mission and your goal, those are the people that are going to be more well-suited. And when you're in a startup, look for people who want to do everything because that's what you're going to need. Not the one who is good at this one little section of a job over here. You want a multifaceted human, right? That can just do all kinds of things. You want the neurodiverse individual. You want the one that is a little octopus with their eight arms and eight different things. That's who you want. Um, so I guess just to kind of hit home on that a little bit more, the, that startups, you know, look for your unique animals and look for the people that really do get that world, love that world, eat, live and breathe for that world and who are more focused on building something and on mission than on anything else. And those will be, those, those types of humans will be the right humans for you. Amazing advice. And thank you for mentioning this, Catherine. Um, you know, where, where people can find more about you and connect sure. with you? Um, find me on LinkedIn. I am all over LinkedIn. Um, please message me, reach out to me. I'm always help. I'm always here to help uh, whoever needs it, um, even if it's just a quick conversation. Also, my, excuse me, my professional site is titanmanagementusa.com. And I do a lot of speaking and teaching. I'll come to your organization and teach you a lot of these things. Reach out to me. My speaker site is kmccordspeaking.com. I will make sure that this will be in the episode description, whether you are listening on your favorite podcasting platform or watching this on, on YouTube. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much for your valuable time and valuable knowledge. I would say, of course, I would, you know, I would say if, if we need to cover more, um, that would take hours and hours because, you know, the way you explain things and, you know, I like also you, you putting it in a kind of like, uh, I would say try to make it funny, which is good. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is, you know, because HR is not the most funniest thing to be very frank with you, right? I think it's uh, hilarious. <laughs> I think HR is hilarious. Yes. <laughs> but I actually, you know, like it reminded me of, of a guest, uh, Sam, who, who, who said like what he's doing with his podcast. So he's bringing a comedian with him to, to explain some little bit like rigid technology, right. you know, and theories and things like this in a, you know, funny way. That's right. It resonates yeah. with people. So yeah, I, I love this because, you know, always it's, it's nice to see people who, you know, like act this way, you know, try to explain the things in, in this way, which made, I believe a lot of things, especially about inclusion, especially when yeah. we talked about, you know, all the other topics that we covered today. Um, so feel free to connect with, with, with Catherine, you know, Please. and about your diversity also as well. This is a very important topic. And I yes. think, you know, we'll see it more, as you mentioned, yeah, I'm trying to summarize mm -hmm. it a bit here. Um, and as usual, this is the way I end my episode guys. Like if you have any questions or feedback about this episode or the show in general, I like to hit the feedback, even if it's bad, no problem. You can just, I want to hear your feedback. Send me an email. You can find also more active on LinkedIn or Twitter if you want also as well, if you are a Twitter fan. Um, if you are interested to be guest like Catherine was guest today, also don't be shy wherever you are in the world. I have guests now from all over the world. I covered from US, UK, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. Time difference is not an issue. I can always accommodate you. Don't worry about it so we can make it happen. And as usual, I hope you enjoyed and we'll meet again in another episode. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.